Hello? Hello? Everybody can hear me now, okay? <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, start the second lecture of this uh, mini course on uh, computational neuroscience. Hope you are well awake to follow the lecture, follow the slides. So the second part is about single neural models. Uh, so we'll start with this uh, so-called main brain equation, which is the fundamental equation for anyone to understand any models, any, any single neural model that uh, can be made about uh, brain cells. So I'll stay here. I think it's. I mean, I mean, in front of you? No. No. Okay. I think for me it's better too. So, um, as I said yesterday, the, uh, the main brain that separates the inside from the outside of the cell uh, is an isolator, is a bilipid uh, layer uh, on, uh, across which there are some proteins that form ion channels. So, this uh, say biological structure can be modeled uh, by a, a physical structure, uh, a, a so called uh, electrical circuit equivalent to the membrane, which captures so the electrical properties of the membrane. So since the membrane is an isolator, we can just uh, model it as a capacitor. And since there are some uh, channels there, we can model these via resistors in series with batteries. And the values of the batteries are just uh, the Nernst potential of uh, any particular ion that can flow along that, uh, uh, that, that, that pore, that channel. So they are the driving forces for the, for the ion currents across the, the uh, protein channels, which means that whenever there's a current, a flux of ions there, uh, this flux will force, will drive the, vo the value of the voltage across the membrane to the equilibrium value for that particular ion, which is given by the Nernst uh, equation, which I, showed, I have shown to you yesterday. So, this is the circuit model. This is the circuit uh, without the biological part in it. So it's just a capacitor in parallel with a conductance or, or resistance, if you want, in parallel with the battery here. And the VM is the membrane voltage across the intracellular, from the intracellular to extracellular space. Uh, extracellular space is seem to be zero. So the intracellular, so the voltage is V intracellular minus V extracellular and there's current flowing across the membrane. This current, I of M, is, has two components here, if you want, the capacitive current and the resistive current. The capacitive current is just given by this equation here, and the resistive current is given by this equation here, considering just one open channel. So the combination, uh, if you have N open channels, uh, due to the laws of uh, association in parallel for resistors, which I will have time to go into here, you have the same equation because the batteries are, have the same voltage here, so you just have in parallel here that several, uh, say, uh, uh, structures like this. Uh, the, the E is the same for all then, so you just add then and you get. That's why people like to use the conductance instead of the resistance. So you just add the conductances. So G is the uh, sum of all the conductance of all the uh, ion channels of a given ch uh, ion in, uh, in the membrane. So the basic equation for the resistive current is the conductance times voltage minus the uh, Nernst potential, or the equilibrium potential for that type of ion. Putting all the, those together, one has the membrane current, which is given by this equation here, which can be rearranged to this familiar form here, where tau is the RC, R times C is the time constant. 
of the main brain. So this dictates the time, the, 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 the time curve of any voltage fluctuation in the main brain, whether it is fast or, or, or slow. And this can be solved analytically, it's very simple, or solved numerically. So for positive injected currents, it implies that the voltage, uh, here I put zero as the resting value. You know that in real life, the resting value is maybe around minus 70 millivolts, but you can just adjust the resting value to the, any value you want. So if it's zero, and then you apply a positive current, which means depolarizing current, you have the voltage that goes towards uh, the depolarized values. And uh, since this model here doesn't have any mechanism that can capture the occurrence of an action potential, it just gives you what's called passive response. So just the depolarized, the graded depolarization that one has uh, that I've shown to you yesterday, if you, if you just inject a current, a uh, subthreshold current. If the current is inhibitory, uh, you have the hyperpolarization. So the voltage decays towards the resting a, 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 a constant value. Uh, and it stays there until you switch off the current. So this is the, the duration of the current. The current is switched off at this point here, constant current, uh, switch on at this point here, and switch off at that point there. So during uh, the occurrence of the current, you have the variation of the voltage. After that, you have the return, the exponential return of the voltage to the resting level. So that's what the, this membrane equation, the passive membrane equation for a cell does. So you have to remember this equation here. It's basically uh, RC circuit. So the, 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 the derivative of the voltage with time is minus V plus a, a constant plus the injected current times the resistance. <coughs> so, uh, base, uh, so this is the basic equation. Now we have back to the main problem of this uh, second part of the talk. We want to model single neurons. So what to model, what to choose in a model? As physicists, we know that we have to simplify models. We have to choose only the features that uh, we assume that matter, that are important for, uh, for us to understand the system. But in case of neurons, there are, very, there are many, many possibilities. You, you have here the different shapes and spike trains and characteristics, morphological characteristics of the, of the cells. So one can, uh, say, decide to model morphology, which means a shape, the, uh, 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 the anatomy as well, so the axonal target of a neuron, uh, whether the neurons are smooth or spiny. You see some neurons have uh, uh, spines uh, in there, some little dots on, on top of the membrane, which are important, or some of them are smooth, or you can just neglect all of these. You can model the electrophysiological response patterns of neurons to currents, so you can focus on these instead of on morphology. You can also focus on the type of neurotransmitters that the neuron release, which is important for the type of synapse you want to model. So you have to choose uh, either one or a combination of those variables, of those features to put in your model. So it's not simple. It's not easy for you to do that, for one to do that. So basic uh, choices one has is to choose a deterministic versus a stochastic neural model or a firing rate model versus a spiky neural model, high dimensional, which means lots of variables, and a low or a low dimensional neural model, or say a model which is more or less biologically plausible or faithful, if you want. So go one step, uh, one point of that uh, after the other one. So uh, why stochastic neural models? Because we know that neurons behave stochastically. They are not reliable. So if I take a neuron, apply a current in vitro, and then do the same experiment, the same situation, same temperature, same neuron, same conditions, same current, the response of the neuron will not be the same. I mean, the spike times won't be the same. And if I repeat this several times, I'll observe that the spike times are not the same. So neurons are really, they have a high degree of variability. So I'll give you some examples from a textbook, which is, by the way, it's, it's, it could be a good a reference for you. It's uh, online. So you can just uh, read it online from the group of Wolfram Gerschner in, in Lausanne, in, in Switzerland. Uh, so this is for awake mouse, cortical neuron, freely whisking, from freely behaving. So you see that uh, usually the voltage fluctuates, and at some point uh, there's some spikes that occur randomly. This is what usually happens if you l just leave the neuron alone whatever the animal is behaving or sleeping or in vitro, from time to time there can be some spikes, some random spikes, stochastic spikes. 
Uh, this is for the kind of experiment that I mentioned to you. So you have a, you take a neuron uh, in vivo in that case. So you record for the animal in vivo. You submit the animal to some sort of stimulus, uh, say random dots. And then you, you, you do this for several trials. So here in the vertical line is trial number from 1 to 15. And, and the, or, the horizontal line is time. And then you measure. Whenever there's a spike from that neuron, you, do, you put a, a vertical bar there along the line. So you see that uh, a long time, the occurrence of spikes of that neuron vary. They are not the same, although the stimulus is more or less the same. And you can count the number of spikes per, say, short time interval. And then you see that this gives a kind of uh, spike rate behavior, but it, it's variable. It's not always the same. It varies a lot. Uh, for in vitro, so you have a, a situation under, say, better control. You have the neuron in, in vitro. You, you inject the current. Uh, you, you, you impale the, the membrane, the, the cell, with a, an, an electrode. And you do, as I mentioned yesterday, you just measure the voltage and you inject the current. You can inject always the same current, either constant or fluctuating current. And the spikes, again, this is for four repetitions of the same experiment. They don't fall on top of each other, so they vary. So neurons have response variability. They don't, they're not reliable. They don't always do the same thing always because, I mean, of stochastic elements present uh, in neurons. What are those stochastic elements? So they, they, they come from several sources, both intrinsic and extrinsic. So the intrinsic ones, you have uh, intrinsic channel noise. So they have the, the channel, the channels uh, scatter along the membrane. There are lots of them, thousands of them. Uh, they, uh, they are subject to noise. So, I mean, from time to time, they can open, they can close. This is, I mean, they, they, they have time of fluctuations that, that cause them to open and, and close. Perhaps you know be this better than me because, I mean, men, some people here work on, on molecular biology, on, on ion channels specifically, so you know that ion channels are noisy uh, elements, noisy beasts. So because of that, you have so-called channel noise. Also, you have uh, unreliable synapses. Synapses are also controlled by... Uh, uh, receptors, which are channels, and also controlled by the release of neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft. And uh, they are quantized, so they, they come in packages. So the number of, of, of neurotransmitters per vesicle varies from one to another. So whenever there's a vesicle that fuses with the membrane and releases a uh, uh, neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft, the number varies. So this is synaptic noise, the synapses are un unre unreliable. Uh, and also there are ex extrinsic sources of noise which come from uh, so all the other neurons in the, in, in, in the, in the brain. So you, a given neuron is subject to uh, uh, a multitude of uh, inputs from afferent inputs from all the other cells in the brain, millions of them that make con contact with them. And this can be seen as a random source of noise because the occurrence of spikes in all the other neurons uh, uh, they, they, I mean, it cannot be predicted. It's a stochastic phenomenon. So it's, if you want, it's like a quenched noise, if you want. So this quasi-random input from many other neurons may be considered like a source of extrinsic noise to neurons. So there, these are the basic sources of noise that one can consider if you want to construct a neural model. Uh, it's more important. Difficult to tell. In general, people consider that synaptic noise is the most important one for the intrinsic ones. Uh, but, of course, this uh, extrinsic source of noise could be probably the most important because the neuron is embedded in a circuit with lots of other cells. And you can predict, unless you can model all of them, but even though you cannot. So probably in a hierarchical way, this would be the most important, this would be the second one, and this would be the third one. Okay? Uh, so if you want to construct a model that captures uh, stochasticity, you, can, you have basically two options. You can uh, generate spikes uh, uh, directly as a, as a stochastic process, so you're, you're, you have the, your voltage membrane. So without uh, disregarding, being totally agnostic about the sources of noise, you just say, well, since neurons are, are noisy, I say that the voltage will randomly fluctuate with a given probability. And this fluctuation can be over threshold from time to time, and then you generate a spike. So you just model V uh, as a stochastic variable directly. Or you can just take your deterministic model, I'll present some examples for you later, and then you add noise, like a noise process, Ornstein, Ullenbeck, or other processes that you can uh, want to, to, 
to, to module, and then you add these equations, the noise term to the equation, and then you, you run it, and, and you can see the effect of. So by this, you can, you can single out all the types of noises. You can have the channel noise, you can have the, the synaptic noise, and so on. Okay? Uh, so I want, uh, I, in this talk, since I only have one hour, and I have one hour for the rest, uh, I won't go into the equations, I won't go into the de details of the models, because otherwise I'll give a say, a week-long course, so that's not the objective here. So now you have all the information that you can use, say, to construct your own model. So let's move now to spiking versus firing rate model. So a spiking model is the one we're used to. Uh, so a neuron receives inputs from other neurons. Uh, these, they affect the main brain potential, and whenever the main brain potential crosses threshold, it spikes, generating a spike train. So this is the output of neurons, a series of spikes called spike train. But uh, if you want, you can, uh, say, lump all of these spikes of, over a short time interval into a variable, which is just the firing rate of a short time interval. So instead of uh, uh, calculating all the spikes, you define the short time uh, interval, and then you count how many spikes the neuron emits over that time, and then you define a new variable, which is the firing rate. And then you have a, a firing rate that varies over time from neuron to neuron. So this is a firing rate model. So you just have the output is a firing rate. It's a continuous value that captures the number of spikes that the, that the neuron emits uh, over a short time interval. So this is the, the firing rate model, it's, which is, uh, by the way, the favorite model for artificial neural networks. So the ones who had uh, talked to me this morning, uh, this is for them. This is the neuron that is used for artificial neural network models. So they have the neuron there, point neuron that receives inputs from other cells, x1, x2, and so on. All of them are mediated by weights, w1, w2, and so on. Uh, based on the weights and the inputs, the neuron calculates the, this internal variable, which is called the activation level, or simply activation. Uh, it is given by just the product of the weight times the input, summed over all the inputs. And sometimes you add a bias term, which is a kind of threshold level for the activation. So this generates the U variable, which is an internal variable. And then, it, based on that, you calculate the output of the neuron, which would, which would represent the firing rate of the neuron. So the firing rate would be just a function of the activation of the neuron, S. Of S would be X equal to F of U. Usually a, a so-called transfer function. This function is transfer function because it, 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 it maps the, the input to the output. So it transfers from input to output. In general, it's a nonlinear function with saturation. So you can choose basically three types of tra transfer functions for, for rate-based neurons. Uh, step function, so neurons have just binary output. So neurons could be, firing, uh, could be not firing at all or could be firing at maximal, maximal frequency. And then you can say the maximum frequency is 1, and you have your binary neuron. So this is highly nonlinear. You can have a, a, a piecewise linear response, so your, your transfer function is linear from a minimum value of, of the activation uh, parameter to the maximum value of that activation, so it just increases linearly. Or you can have a sigmoidal function, which is, say, say the more realistic of all, because it's a continuous function that captures the nonlinear behavior of this firing rate uh, function and the saturation for sorry there's some terms here in Portuguese but this is increase of a so if you increase the a here which is the slope of that function you can model you can using this equation you can have either a, 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 something that looks like the linear response here or the uh, degree function that a uh, heavy side type function response there so the nonlinear response so these are the three basic functions that one can use for modeling rate-based neurons. Uh, so firing rate neurons historically are among the earliest forms of, of neuron, u, neurons used from the later th uh, 30s. They are the default model for artificial neural networks, as I said. And uh, uh, if you want to model the brain set of artificial neural networks, usually you say that a, a rate model would capture the behavior of a population of cells. And then your variable would be the average firing rate of all the cells in that population. So what does the population rate model would be? So suppose you have a population of cells somewhere in the brain, and the neurons there uh, are so close together that they can be considered as homogeneous. So they behave more or less in the same way. They are from the same area, from the same circuit, so they more or less 
uh, behave in the same. They respond, say, to the same, more or less to the same feature of the, from the outside world. Uh, of course, due to the noise, you have variability in the spike times. Uh, and then you can define the firing rate or activity, A of T, of this population as just uh, uh, the sum of spikes emitted by the population over a short time interval divided by the number of neurons that in that population. So this would be the activity. Uh, so the activity would be the variable that would, would be, uh, say, similar to the F, F of U in the rate-based model. Okay? Uh, Assuming that you have a large group, large number, large number of populations like this, so you do have a network of populations of cells. So instead of a network of single neurons, you have a network of populations of cells. Each population is characterized by uh, an, activi an activity. So each population I is, is characterized by an activity A sub I of T. And the populations interact among each other via weights, which are no longer synaptic weights, but effective weights, if you want. So they capture this, the influence of one uh, population over the other population. So usually in, in the computational neuroscience uh, community, uh, the second index here codes for the presynaptic cell, and the first index here codes for the postsynaptic. So it's the reverse order that you usually, we usually do in physics. So the response of the IJ the, as a function of the, pro, the, the sum of J, capital J, Little j, small j, i, a, i. So you sum over i here. Okay? So that j, i, j is a matrix that captures the effective coupling between the cells, not the, the synaptic coupling itself. Okay? Uh, so going to model dimension. So you can have, uh, say, very complicated, very simple model. So the, the dimension co uh, is, is based on the number of variables that you have in the model. Could be one, two, three, and so on. Uh, so in general, the higher the number of dimensions of a model, the more uh, difficult to understand its behavior. So this is the favorite model for biologists. Uh, and the, the, the lower the dimension is easier, the easier it is to understand uh, the behavior. So the favorite model for physicists and mathematicians. Uh, it's important to notice that each variable has a, an, an equation associated to it. So if you want to simulate it in computer, uh, you would have a, a, a very expensive simulation if you have a lot of variables. But these days, one has powerful computers, so one can do that. <clears throat> so what's the criteria for biological faithfulness? There are lots of them, so there's even a difficult question to pose. But anyway, so explicitness would be one of these. So the, the model variables can be mapped to measured quantities. So the voltage, for example, this is an explicit quantity. You, you have a voltage in your model, and you can measure the corresponding voltage. In the, in, the, in, the, in the cell. You have a capacitance in your model, you can, have, you can measure the, cap, the membrane capacitance, uh, resistant and so on. But you can have a model with some parameters which are not directly mapped into uh, variables measured by biologists. So in that case, you have abstract, uh, abstract models. So the number of details that you want to include. include. So you can have uh, the morphologies of the dendrites, so you've seen yesterday that some neurons have very, uh, say, uh, interesting, rich dendritic arborizations. What is the role? What What is the role of those dendrites? Of those rich, profuse uh, dendritic arborizations? Nobody knows. But if they are there, they have a metabolic cost. If they were not uh, deselected by evolution, they must have some role. So it's it could be important to simulate them and then simulate the morphologies and characteristics. Uh, all the types of ionic channels present in the membrane. So that families of potassium channels, families of sodium channels, families of chloride channels, families of calcium channels, or all the possible channels. So perhaps, or possibly, each one of them would have a, an impact on the behavior of the cell. <clears throat> so eventually, one would like to put all of those in the, in, in, in the model. Intracellular biochemical mechanisms like calcium buffering, diffusion, second messengers. I mean, so you can add as many parameters, as many features as you want. But then, of course, the model will be more and more complicated. You can add the extracellular potential, so you couple your model to the extracellular potential, so you can model the generation of extracellular potentials, the effect of one neuron over uh, distant neurons, not synaptically coupled to them via the, 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 the fields that are generated 
mostly due to the currents that flow through the channels, so the membranes. So those currents, they enter in one part of the cell and they exit in another part of the cell, forming small dipoles in the cell. And these generate dipole fields that propagate all over the extracellular space. And these are the origins, for example, of the EEG that people measure. So the EEG doesn't capture the spiking, the actual spiking of the cells, but it, it's, it, it captures the movement of the ions across the, the channels, mostly in the dendrites of the cell. Anyway, I don't have time to enter into this here. Also, one uh, important criterion is how a spike is generated. So if you want to capture all the processes that are responsible for a spike generation, you have to include this in your model, and then the model will be more expensive. Or you can just say, well, I have a threshold there, and whenever the voltage crosses the threshold, I by hand assume that there's a spike there. So you don't model the generation of a spike, but you just have spikes on your model put by hand. Okay. So let's go now to some examples of uh, <coughs> single cell models. The, the most famous one, uh, the most influential one, uh, not the first one, but could be arguably the first um, biophysically detailed model, is the Hodgkin-Huxley model. I'm sure you have, may have heard about it. This is Hodgkin and Huxley. So it's the same idea. So it's based on the, the membrane model that I presented to you before, so a, a circuit that is equivalent to the membrane. Uh, but it, it has, uh, it has two, uh, three, three ion channels, a sodium channel, potassium channel, and a leakage channel. The leakage channel is a passive uh, channel. So it's like the one from the model that I presented to you. But if all the, the sodium and potassium channels are variables, so the conductances can vary in ways that were determined by Hodgkin-Huxley. And, and the, the, vari the variation of those channels is what makes uh, what generates action potentials in a cell. So the model has four parameters, the voltage parameter, and three other parameters that were used by Hodgkin and Huxley to model the dynamics of the uh, sodium and potassium, potassium conductances. So for the potassium conductance, they needed uh, one parameter, N, which is called the activation variable of the potassium. And for the sodium, they needed two other parameters, M and H. M is the activation variable of the uh, sodium and H is the inactivation variable of the uh, sodium. And by running the equations with the parameters that they gave to us, you can simulate uh, action potentials. And by the way, they, they did uh, simulate at the time in 1951, 52, when they published the, the, the series of papers. So they, they used the very uh, primitive computers, if one want to call computers, that they had at the time. They were able to simulate the, the equations that they propose and show that they actually uh, pr they produce uh, action potentials that could be well fitted to the experiments that they themselves did. So that's why they won the Nobel Prize, because they did everything. So they, they created a model, they did experiments, they, 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 they conceived the, the, the conceptual model, they had the equations, the mathematical model, the physical model, and then they simulated it. And they showed that the simulated model corresponds to what is measured. So it's one of the, uh, say, hallmarks of the science in the 20th century. Anyway, so, so what they did experimentally before they, they, they wrote a series of papers is that they demonstrated that uh, at rest, the, I will read this because I think it's faster. I don't have <clears throat> much time, so I think it's better to read. No? Then you follow me at my speed. <clears throat> so the conductance of the membrane at rest of a squid, a squid axon, which was the model system that they used to work. So they took the axon, the giant axon of the squid, so it's a very uh, uh, thick, it's not it's called giant axon because it's long, but because it's thick. So it's so thick that they, they could impay it with, with the uh, primitive electrodes that they had at the time. You have some videos on the internet, so it's, it's very interesting to see the techniques that they had. So they just uh, impale the cell, and because they, the, ex, the intracellular space is like a paste, like toothpaste. So the, ex, the, the electrode stays there, glued to the cell without touching the membrane. So they could measure the voltages, the inside voltage using this technique. Uh, so anyway, so uh, they said, they, they, they measured that the, the, the conductance of the membrane uh, to potassium is 25 times higher than conductance to sodium. So at rest, membrane is much more uh, uh, permeable to potassium than to sodium. This is the basic fact, fact one. So then there's an action potential. At the peak of the action potential, action potential, 
the membrane conductance to sodium becomes much larger than the membrane conductance to potassium, 20 times larger. So at, at the peak of the action potential, it reverts, the, the situation reverts, and the membrane is much more permeable to sodium than to potassium, which means that more sodium ions flow across the membrane. And then during the after hyperpolarization, you know, the after, after, after hyperpolarization time is, say, suppose this is a V rest. This would be zero, so this would be minus 70 or something. An action potential is something like that. The, oh, so there's the rising time, the decay time. This is the, when the, the voltage becomes uh, below zero. This is the after hyperpolarization because this is the hyperpolarization period, and then it, the recovery phase. So during this uh, period here, uh, the membrane conductance to sodium is very, very low, so the membrane is more, mostly shut down to sodium, and the conductance to potassium is larger than at rest. So the membrane becomes more, uh, say, permeable to potassium at rest. And you see, when I say that the membrane is permeable to sodium or to potassium, this means that the voltage, so if the membrane is permeable to, to potassium, this means that the voltage is driven towards the equilibrium value of potassium which is E of the potassium, which is, uh, say, minus 75 millivolts. If the, the membrane is permeable to sodium, it's the opposite. So the membrane voltage is driven towards the, the Nernst potential of the sodium, of sodium, which is plus uh, 50. Let's, let's put it like that, very high. So that what means but when I say that the membrane is more permeable to one ion or the other. So the voltage is forced towards either very positive or very negative situation. So how, I mean, and this explains the origin of the action potential. So you have your model there, you have the sodium channels, you have the potassium channels, you have the leakage. By the way, the leakage channel is due to several other ions, including some sodium and potassium channels, and it was mostly used by then to fit the equation. So they had some parameters that could be adjusted so that they could fit the equation. And there is leakage because they, since they impaled the, main, the, the membrane with an the electrode, there was some leak current through the, this, the hole created. So this is the basic equation. Uh, so you see, it's the same form of the membrane equ equation that I showed to you before. Uh, the VDT equals the, the, the temp due to the conductance to potassium, temp due to the conductance of sodium, sorry about that, and the, the, the leakage as well. So when uh, <clears throat> at rest, the membrane is more permeable to potassium. That's why at rest, the voltage is close to the potassium equilibrium. But then you, you depolarize the, the membrane, and when you depolarize the membrane, uh, it, it, suddenly some sodium channels open, and sodium channels, uh, once they are open, there's a positive feedback mechanism, so they open more and more, so there are lots of channels that open, and the opening of the sodium channels make the conductance larger to sodium than potassium. And since the conductance is, is larger to sodium than to potassium, the voltage is driven is forced towards a positive value. So this is why, that, that's the explanation why the voltage grows to a very positive value. But then when at the peak, the sodium channels close. At the peak and then in the downwards phase, the sodium channels start to close. So the, what was a previously a positive feedback becomes a negative feedback. And then, then the sodium channels close. And the potassium, uh, but the potassium uh, conductance is, is, uh, continues to increase. The sodium channel, the sodium conductance decays to nearly zero, and this explains the refractory period that I, I, I mentioned to you yesterday. A refractory period is the period of time during which it's impossible to generate another action potential, or very difficult to generate. And it's, very, it's impossible because the sodium uh, is, conductance is zero, so the membrane is closed, it's shut down to sodium, and sodium is what makes the, this the neuron spike. So if there's no conductance to sodium, sorry? Both sodium and potassium have positive charge. Both sodium yeah, they're cations. How do they, I mean, this is due to the intrinsic characteristics of the, of the, of, of the, the, the channels themselves. 
so the, 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 say the sodium channels has uh, gates that are sensitive to voltage. Some of them uh, I, I do, some of them open whenever you depolarize, some of them close when you hyperpolarize. So, yeah, the gates are sensitive. No, 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 it's the gates, yeah, it's just the gates. So it's a molecular biology problem, so I won't have time to enter into this here. And uh, this also it was, it was an important for Hodgkin, Hodgkin and Huxley. You must remember at that time, 1952, they didn't even know that ion channels existed. Ion channels were discovered much later by Sackman and other guys. So, so that's why the model, they formulated the model in a very abstract way, using conductances and, and, and activation and inactivation variables. Anyway, so, uh, so the, uh, the fact that during the hyperpolarization phase, the membrane is, uh, the conductance to sodium is very low and the conductance to potassium is high means that uh, you, you cannot create an action potential and also ex explains why the voltage here is hyperpolarized because then the membrane is, is, more, is, completely perm is, is highly permeable to potassium, so potassium dominates it and it forces the membrane voltage to go to the uh, equilibrium voltage of, the pot of potassium, which is lower than the equilibrium voltage of the membrane at rest, which consider all the ions. So this is the basic mechanism. So what's, how they fit the equations mathematically? So they measure the conductances of potassium and sodium for several situations. Uh, and they did this because they developed a technique called voltage clamp. So they were able to fix the voltage at whatever value they wanted. So by fixing the voltage at a given level, they prevented the, net, the cell uh, uh, to, uh, of generating an action potential. So you, they could just measure the current due to that ion, to a given ion, uh, <clears throat> when, when the voltage was, was fixed. What's the behavior of a current when the voltage is fixed? So the, the voltage would like to increase or decrease because of the membrane would be depolarized or hyperpolarized, but they fixed the voltage at a given value and they could measure the, the current that would uh, be uh, flowing at that time. And they could do this for particular types of ions because they, they did the experiments in which they, uh, they, they put the cell in a bath without sodium. So at the time they didn't know blockers because they didn't know ion channels. So they didn't know how to block ion channels. But they could uh, take away, say, sodium from uh, a bath and put another cation that would substitute sodium but uh, would, would permeate through the membrane. So they could either investigate situations in which there were only potassium or in, and situations in which there were both sodium and potassium. And by subtracting one from the other, they could measure the current due, say, to, to sodium and also to potassium. And that's, why, that's how they measured. They, they, could, they were able to measure the conductances, which are given by the equation. You just divide the, the, the current by the voltage. Uh, so they had several measurements. And they, they, they basically uh, measure, and they model the, the current using this equation here. So G of X is the maximal conductance of, uh, of that ion. So if, imagine that all the ion channels for that uh, uh, ion are open in a given cell. The thousands of them are open. So there's a maximum conductance, which is the sum of the conductance for each individual channel. P is, 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 is a probabilistic factor that gives just the fraction of GX that is present at any given time. So how much of this maximal conductance is active at a given, a given time? So we know today that this is due to the gates, but at that time they didn't know about gates, so they just measured this probability. It's a number between 0 and 1. And V minus EX is just the difference between the voltage and the Nernst potential of the ion X. And how, they, how did they model the, this, this fraction P? They model it as a product of two terms uh, to some, po some powers. In this case, R and S. So M, the M variable, is so-called the activation variable. So it's a variable that grows from 0 to 1 with increase of V. So it's a variable, all of them are sensitive to the, to the voltage. But M increases with V. So M is like this. M variable increases with voltage. And uh, the H variable is H, yeah, obeys the opposite. So it's very high when the, the voltage is low, and the rest could be at any point. Yeah, that, that doesn't matter. That's then it was just this. But the behavior is that if you increase the voltage, you increase the, the activation variable, 
and you decrease the, in, the inactivation variable. So the inactivation variable inactivates. And if you decrease the voltage, you de-inactivate the voltage. And the uh, R and S are just the parameters that were used by Hodgkin and Huxley to fit the, 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 the measurements that they had. So the, they were the smallest integer, integer numbers that could uh, give a good fit. So for the case of uh, potassium, potassium had, so the potassium current is persistent. So you see, it doesn't inactivate. So the potassium current has only an inactive, uh, sorry, uh, uh, an activation variable like this one here. So the potassium doesn't have the inactivation, has only an activation variable, which is the variable M there, and R is four, is the smallest integer number that they could find that could fit. And this is because there's four gates, four, four, four gates in, the, in, the, in, the, in the potassium channel. Sodium conducts, on the other hand, is transient, so it increases and decreases. So they model this as a product of an activation and an inactivation variable to the power of, uh, say, R and S. And R is three, and S is one for the sodium one. So, and by doing this, they were able to, to fit all the measurements that they had. Uh, okay, so here you have a cartoon. So you can, I, I'll, I'll, I'll put all those, I'll give all those slides to, to Fernando, so you can go through all of these, but I don't have time to enter into the detail of this uh, Hodgkin Huxley model now. Uh, so, but here you have the time constants for all the, the variables and the behavior of the variables. Never mind, so you can, you can follow this. So by doing this, they actually uh, not only modeled the behavior of the uh, conductances in the, uh, in the giant axon of the squid, but also they proposed a formalism, an approach to model any, um, any, any conductance of any cell type from the brain. And of course, at the time, they didn't know this, or may, they may have hinted at but later on, when people started to use the same approach to model other cells from other parts of the brain, they noticed that it was possible. It is possible to use the formalism that was proposed by Hodgkin Huxley. So this formalism of activation, inactivation channels uh, to model any other uh, uh, conductance in any other cell type. So this is also sometimes called conductance-based approach to modeling single cells, because to model single cell, you have to, to, to model the conductances of the cell using these activation and inactivation variables. So, and later on, when ion channels were discovered, uh, people observed that they were stochastic. So here you have several experiments measuring the conductance of, uh, uh, say, individual, cell, in, in, in individual channels. They are stochastic. Sometimes they open, sometimes they close. But if you add up, and take the average, you have behavior that are very similar to the conductances measured by Hodgkin and Huxley. So the potassium conductance is persistent, the average, ensemble average, is persistent, and the sodium conductance, this is a, for a population of, of sodium channels, is transient. So this somehow justifies the approach that was used by, that was introduced by Hodgkin and Huxley. Here you have the gates, it's shown here, so this is for a sodium, or any, any, any channel that has uh, oh, this, this probably is better, that has activation and inactivation gates. So uh, for a given voltage level, say uh, V rest, uh, the activation is somehow more or less closed, but still there's some fraction of cells that can pass, and the inactivation gate is open. Then you depolarize, and then you suppose that the activation gate reacts faster than the uh, inactivation gate. So it opens very quickly, allowing ions to flow, but then uh, the inactivation gate closes at a slower time scale. And it, when it closes, the, the, the conductance goes back to zero. So this would be a scheme for a sodium channel. Uh, <clears throat> so this could be modeled in the Hodgkin-Huxley formalism by just uh, this same equation, G bar, which is the maximal conductance, times P times V mi minus E. P is the probability. Now we would say that instead of just being a fraction of G bar, which can be achieved, is the probability of an open channel. And this probability is given by the product of two terms. M is just the fraction of open activation gates. And H is the fraction of open inactivation gates uh, to, say, powers A and B. So you have basically four types of, of gates. You have passive gates, which don't, which don't have a, uh, neither activation or inactivation gates. That would be the leakage. Uh, channel in the Hodgkin-Huxley model. You could have transient uh, gates, like this one, which have both 
activation and inactivation gates. You can have persistent channels like the potassium channel, which has only activation gates that behave like that. Or you can have anomalous or activated by hyperpolarization uh, gates, uh, channels, sorry, which have only the inactivation gates. So these are odd, say, type channels, but exist, in fact, uh, that uh, close when you depolarize the membrane. And they are activated when you hyperpolarize the membrane, when you take the voltage to more negative values than the rest. So you can use this to model different types of, of uh, channels uh, or cells in, in the brain. So as I say here, so they developed a model to model the, uh, squid, the giant, squid giant axon, which is from, uh, uh, say, primitive animal. But in any way, uh, it, although it's very different from mammalian, say, cortical neurons, uh, uh, the ion currents that are present in cortical neurons have similarities with the ion currents present in the squid or other uh, invertebrates. Uh, so since they can be modeled in a similar way, we can say Hodgkin-Huxley type models or Hodgkin-Huxley formalism or conductance-based models. So this, is, this opened the possibility of modeling all kinds of cells <coughs> from all kinds of brains using the same formalism, same unifying formalism. Uh, so, and then people later discovered that there are lots of types of ion channels. So this is just some of them with their characteristics and so on. So you can just put all of them. If, I mean, not all of them, but I mean, if you want to model a given cell from a given region of the brain, you have to know from biologists what types of ion channels are present there. So if they tell you, well, this type of cell has, say, a fast sodium uh, delay rectifier potassium and an A current, an inward rectifier potassium current, has some channel, calcium channels. So if they tell you that there are, say, 10 different types of channels, well, you can either say, well, no, I don't care about that, it's too many, or you can just add all of them and put all of them into your model, and then you, you run it. Uh, since I'm not measuring time, Fernando, please let me know when I, oh, yeah. Well, yeah, oh, I can watch that, yeah. But I don't know when I started. I, I, I started five minutes, okay, anyway. So based on that, you can construct so-called detailed compartmental models. Because if you want to add ion channels plus dendrites to a model, what you can do? So you take, you characterize morphologically a cell. You can do this via several techniques. And then what people do is a sort of finite element method, which in the terminology of computational neuroscience is just called compartmentalization. So you subdivide your dendritic arbor, your dendrites into uh, compartments, and each compartment is modeled using the cable model from electromagnetism, from electro, uh, electricity, that, uh, uh, theory that was developed in the, 19th, in the 19th century by Kelvin at the end of the 19th century. Uh, uh, and then you create, say, a compartmental model in which each, uh, ca each cable here, each compartment is modeled as, say, uh, a single uh, Hodgkin-Huxley type cell with lots of ionic channels and capacitance and so on. And they are connected by axial, ax axial resistances like here. So by doing this, one can construct, say, very elaborate single cell models like this one, the one here, the one here, which is a model of the cerebellar Purkinje cell, which is one of the cells in the human brain that has l larger number of dendrites richer dendritic structure. And you can do this in very fine detail, say this model here. This is the original one by the Schutter and Bauer from 1994. It has 5,550 compartments. I think the newest version of this model should have more, should have, say, close to 6,000 compartments. I don't know. And then you can uh, do lots of simulations with this model. So you can inject current at any point you want, at a soma, at any dendritic branch there. And then you can measure the propagation. You can simulate the propagation of the voltage across the dendritic tree and observe the dynamics of it. So you can model single cells and observe behavior. Uh, well, of course, this is very interesting, very nice. but. Uh, uh, it, 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 it may create the impression that you're really modeling the real thing because you put lots of information there, lots of dendrites, lots of ion channels. But, I mean, one has to be cautious about that, you know, because increasing complexity not necessarily leads to a better model. It creates the impression that you're having a, a good model, but, some, some, but sometimes not. Because, uh, why? Well, so each new compartment requires the, the modeler to decide which conductances to put in it. So for each compartment, that I have here, which conductances should I put? 
So in general, one, one doesn't know that. There are few cells in the brain for which uh, it's known exactly what are the ion channels present and how the density, so the, how the maximal conductances vary with distance from soma. So uh, if you don't know uh, the, the ion channels that you have to put there, you, can get, you have to guess. So that, that dozens of models, even some models that I have done myself, in which you just guess. So you, you want to model a cell from a given brain region. You don't have the details for that, the data for that cell. You take from a similar cell or from a similar cell from a different animal. If you don't have from a related animal, you take from any animal you can have. So you, you basically you guess the ion channels. <clears throat> Uh, and also, uh, as the number of parameters increases, you, you have lots of possible combinations of the parameters that can generate the same behavior. How can you decide which one is the best? There are several studies in the literature showing that you can combine different, in different ways the conductances and parameters of the compartments and generate the same behavior in the space of parameters. So which one is the correct one? One doesn't know. So you have to take this comment seriously when you want to construct your biophysically detailed model. <clears throat> so because of that, it's important to try and reduce the models to see if one can grasp the behavior in a, using analytical formula or approaches. So the, so the whole industry of reducing compartmental models, which is basically uh, reducing the, the, the structure of the dendritic tree. The basic uh, way of doing this is by assuming that oh, you can compact, you can represent all the the rich dendritic tree of a cell by just a, a stick made of several compartments, but a linear stick. So this is famous ball and stick model. So you have, say, in this case, a soma and two dendrites. And the two dendrites would represent all the dendritic tree of a given cell. But anyhow, for each compartment here, you have also to, uh, to put the ionic channels with their parameters, and you don't know that, so you have to adjust. So there are a lot of, uh, say, uh, data fitting uh, tricks used when you want to construct so-called reduced models. This is a model from one of my students uh, many years ago when he modeled, I uh, guess, some cell from the olfactory system. And the response is, you see, usually when you want to fit the parameters, you want to measure the voltage response of, the, of a given measurement and the voltage response of your model. And if the fitting is good, you say you have a good model. <coughs> So there are several ways of constructing reduced Hodgkin-Huxley uh, models. Uh, so you see the original Hodgkin-Huxley model had uh, one transi transient sodium current, one persistent potassium current, and one leak current. Uh, and they are modeled by four parameters, N, A, N, M, and H. So you can remove N, and you have only uh, N is the activation variable of the potassium. So if you remove N, you remove the potassium conductance. So you have only sodium channels. You can remove H. And then you have uh, a sodium current which is persistent, doesn't inactivate, and a potassium current. And then you can generate other, say, daughter models out of those. And you can study the dynamics of N in general in phase space using dynamical systems tools. And then, then you enter with mathematics, then you can, you're able to understand in an analytical way or qualitative way the behavior, the, the, the dynamical origins of all those currents, which for a biologist may not, may not be so important, but for a physicist is really important because you understand the dynamic origin of a given behavior uh, using dynamical systems too. So you, you describe it in terms of uh, limit cycles, bifurcations, using all the terminology that you well know about uh, dynamical systems. Uh, okay. And the important thing of doing this is that you reduce the number of variables from four, which is already too large, one would say, for the Hodgkin-Huxley model, say, to two variables, which is affordable for, for a mathematician or a physicist. Uh, so here are some examples of uh, reduced ADH models. So if you take the original equations by Hodgkin-Huxley, and you see that slide that I just uh, skipped, showing the, the, the time, the dynamic behaviors of the four variables, especially the, 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 the N and M and H variables, you see the M variable, the activation variable of the sodium is by far the fastest one of them. So as soon as they depolarize the cell, the M variable uh, jumps to the maximum value, to the steady state value. So you can assume that the, uh, the, the M variable is fixed at the steady state variable, so you get rid of this variable. And then the, just by observing the curves of the N and H, uh, 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 
parameters, you see that they, are more or less, they, they, they behave in a more or less similar way to this equation here. So they are related. N and H are related via this equation. So you also can get rid of, say, of the H variable. And then you, you, you reduce to a two-variable two model with a voltage and an N variable, which is the activation variable of the sodium. So you have a two-dimensional model, which you can study in phase space. So you have here V and N, and you can uh, plot that in no clients, which are the curves associated to the derivatives of those two variables being equal to zero, and then you can study the dynamics here. I don't have time to go into the detail, but you know, I mean, given that, you, you can use, uh, uh, you can either do analytical calculations or use some of those dynamical systems tools that are available there in the market to analyze the system and, and determine uh, what characterizes the excitability of the cell, the origin of a spike, and so on. And based on that, Fitzhugh and later Nagumo in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, they proposed a model which also has two variables, now abstract variables, but they capture the same qualitative dynamics of the reduced model that I presented to you. So this is the reduced Hodgkin and Huxley model. You see that the uh, V, no, no client, the no client associated to the voltage has this cubic shape here. And, uh, the N no client has this kind of sigmoidal shape there. So Fitzhugh observing that say, well, let's say propose an abstract model which also has, say, has two variables, a V variable which would be similar to the voltage, and then W variable which would be similar to the N variable. And the no client of V is cubic, and the no client of W is just a linear, which can be adjusted to any position you want. And by studying it using dynamical systems, they could uh, completely understand the dynamics of the model. St unstable branches, stable branches, and so on. So they, can, they, could, they were able to characterize. And this also created a whole industry of creating uh, simplified, so-called simplified neurons, neuron models that could be analyzed using dynamical system tools. Uh, I think which by far is the most advanced area of computational neuroscience, single cell understanding, single cell modeling. We are very good now at the moment to understand and model single neurons. We still don't are very far from understanding, say, two or more than two neurons connected together. But one single neuron, we are good in understanding behavior. Uh, and then, uh, say, there's a, 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 an extra simplifying step that you can use. So instead of uh, reducing the model, you can just say, uh, well, I, I, I don't care about the mechanism that generates a spike. So I won't model the mechanism that generates. I just say that, uh, well, there's a threshold. I assume there's, there's a threshold. Whenever the voltage crosses the threshold, I generate a spike. So I can have, then it's possible to have non-Hodgkin Huxley type models, both one-dimensional, one two-dimensional, uh, which not explicitly model a spike. So the emphasis of this type of models is on the neuronal response. So it's on the spike trains and not on the mechanism responsible for the generation of spikes. Uh, and they are generated by hand. So here are some examples. The leaky integrating fire, the famous leaf model, which is by far the most popular simple model used uh, nowadays. There are non-linear versions of that. There's uh, Izikevich model. Izikevich is a Russian scientist now based in the US. Adaptive exponential integration fire model proposed by Gessner and, and Brete from France and Gessner from Switzerland uh, some years ago. So I uh, see that I'm exploding time and still have reached more or less half of the first talk. So I really have to rush now. I'm sorry about that. Anyway, so uh, yeah, of course, I, I, there are lots of maths here. I don't have time to go into this. So this is the leaf model. Probably I will explain this one and the rest I would just uh, skip. So the leaf model has, is described by the same equation, same one, ex is exactly the same equation of that uh, main brain equation that I presented in the very first slide. Tau dv dt minus v minus v minus v rest times r times i. So, uh, so the, the, the behavior of this model, when it, whenever it is stimulated by a constant current, imagine that a uh, step current constant is just an exponential increase until it reaches the steady state value. And then you, put by, you, you, you assume that your, threshold, your voltage threshold is here, at this point here. So if the voltage is increasing and reaches this, the steady state value, which is below the threshold, the cell doesn't spike. So it's just depolarized, but doesn't spike. It has a sub-threshold fluctuation. And when you switch off the stimulus, it decays. But 
if the voltage increases and crosses threshold, you by hand say, well, at this point here, there's a spike. And you put by hand a spike there, and then you reset. You reset the voltage to a V reset value, also decided by hand, but it's chosen to mimic what happens to a real cell. So you instantaneously reset the voltage to a reset value, and then you can even uh, create a refractory period. So you hold the, vo the reset voltage there for a certain time, from spike time, say, to spike time plus tau ref. And tau ref is just the, 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 the duration of the refractory time. And after that, the cell is free to uh, uh, vary the voltage again. So this is the response of a uh, leaf model, leaky integrating fire. It's called leaky because it has a leakage term here. The, the first model was just integrating fire. It didn't have leakage, so it just had a linear increase. But it's not realistic. So this is, is better. But you see, by, if you inject a constant current, the instant uh, spike times are always, I mean, equally uh, spaced. So it doesn't capture the variability that one has in single cells, but it's a very simple model, very inexpensive model to use in large-scale simulations of cells. Uh, so here is the dynamics of the leaf model. It explains why it behaves like that. I will leave this for you to, to read after, after talk. Uh, then you can add a nonlinear term. So you can say instead of having a linear term there, you can have a nonlinear term, and then you have different behaviors. Also, I'm sorry, I really have too much material here, but anyway, uh, this is really not important for the rest of the talks, the rest of this talk and the rest of the other talk. Uh, I, uh, you, since well, people know that the real cells have adaptation, so if you stimulate with a constant current, they start spiking and then they uh, adapt to a, a different frequency and they remain that frequency with time. So the, 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 the uh, firing frequency the dependency with the current depends on uh, in which point of the sequence you are. So if you just take the first two spikes, you have a f frequency curve. And if you take, uh, say, spikes here uh, after the beginning, after the onset, you have a different behavior. So neurons have adaptation. So one, one way of doing this is by introducing an, uh, another, an extra current there that doesn't capture any, any, any specific ion channel, but has a, a sole purpose, the, 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 the generation of uh, larger inter-spike intervals uh, whenever the neuron is firing at fast speed. So whenever it's fast, very quickly, you, you add, uh, you increase this conductance of this adaptation variable, and by doing this, you decrease the likelihood that the neuron will emit another spike. So if you put everything together, a non-linear voltage term plus an adaptation term, you can have... Uh, basically, uh, say, two-dimensional leak integration fire model. So you have the voltage variable, it's easy to see here, plus a, a, a variable for the adaptation. People call recovery variable in this terminology here. So you have two-dimensional models. The first one was proposed by Izikiewicz. You have here his web page. Uh, and uh, the nonlinearity that he used was a quadratic one. So he used a quadratic leak integration fire plus an adaptation variable with four parameters. And by adjusting the four parameters, he was able to show that you could reproduce all kinds of, not all, but a lot of possible kinds of firing patterns that neurons have, just by adjusting four parameters. So it's a very inexpensive model that can reproduce spiking behavior of most cortical cells. Later on, Bretter and, and Gershner did the same thing using an exponential. So the, the nonlinearity in their case is just an exponential, nonlinearity. And by doing this, they also had the same behavior. So they were able to uh, reproduce all kinds of spiking behavior of, of cortical cells. And this is called adaptive exponential integrated fire model, or, call, or ADEX. I think I don't have it here. ADEX. So you have some description on there here. And Izikiewicz produced this slide here uh, in 2003. I added ADEX here as well. So it it's kind of shows you uh, the cost of implementation of a model and the biological plausibility, so the number of biological features captured by the model. So you see the Hodgkin-Huxley model here is by far the most realistic one in terms of uh, spike be spiking behaviors, but is, well, at the time it was considered prohibitive, but nowadays it's possible to simulate. But anyway, it's a very uh, cost, costly model. Uh, there are different types of models there in the zoology of models, and the easy capture and ADEX also, they reproduce spiking behavior very realistic, and they are uh, efficient in terms of computational implementation. Uh, 
So this is just a, a summary of what I said. So you have detail versus simplified. So in general, people use uh, detailed models uh, are difficult to be modeled because you need parameters for all neurons, which is a phenomenal task. But anyway, still, they are still used. I mean, one can do computational neuropharmacology, so you can test in your model. So if, as long as you put all kinds of ionic channels in a given cell model and you construct a network model out of those cells, you can test the effect of changing parameters from a given channel on the behavior of the network. So you can do principled analysis of uh, manipulations, pharmacological manipulations on the behavior of the network. Uh, and you can also study the role of functional properties of single cells on the behavior of the network. Uh, but uh, the simple models are, are still the, 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 the choice if you want to construct large-scale models of the brain, so models with uh, thousands or millions of cells because they're really inexpensive to be implemented computationally. Computation, and they still capture some characteristics of the spike in activity of, of real cells. Okay, so I'll stop now. This is part... Uh, this is time, yeah, good, probably a good time to stop. And then I'll start the next time after coffee break. Coffee break, no? No. Just what? Three minutes. Oh, okay, sorry. Then I'll start in three minutes' time with the synaptic models, and then I'll move to the other lecture. This is still part of second lecture, but anyway, I'll go fast, and then I'll finish the other one. Okay, thank you. <laughs>